good to us. Why don't we just let out a big hallelujah. Wow, yeah. God is good. He's holy forever.
worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are, we make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you, you are here, healing every life, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around, I worship you. Stop working. 
say this morning that you are the way maker, that you are the promise keeper, that you are the light in the darkness. I feel like the Lord put a word on my heart this morning. I feel like He's challenging us. We're trying to find solutions outside of Him. Some of us are trying to find solutions outside of Him. We're trying to make it happen. I felt this conviction on my own heart and life this week. There's parts of our life that we're trusting to Him and there's parts of our heart that we're trying to to make it happen. And I feel like He's challenging us this morning to reach beyond our experiences and to reach for the promises. Because we want our experiences to match the promises. And when they don't, we need to go after the promises and not just rest on the experience that we've had so far. Otherwise, we start changing our theology. For every problem, there is a promise. And this morning, we're in this room and we've got some problems. There's people in this room with problems. Who's got problems? (laughs) In our families and in our bodies, in our bank accounts, in our own hearts. And there's a promise for your problem this morning. And it's for us to reach beyond, to reach beyond what we're experiencing so far and say, I'm gonna reach for the promise. I'm gonna reach for the promise that you have, Lord. I'm gonna rest on your promises. I'm gonna rest on your promises that you are the way maker, that you are the one that makes the way. I'm thankful for the the healthcare system and and I'm thankful for the counsellors and the teachers. But Jesus, you're 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 the most high and You are the one who knows the way through and You are the one that restores and You are the one that brings the breakthrough. You're the Bel Parazine God, You bring the breakthrough. And so as we continue to sing this, I want you to reach for the promise for your problem. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. And some of us, because we don't feel it and we don't see it, we've stopped trusting and He wants us to trust Him. Even when I don't feel you, Jesus, I had an experience this week where I had a three hour prayer session with a friend and, and there was a season in my life where I could, where it was kind of like a black dot where I couldn't see Him and I couldn't feel Him. And my friend says, all right, let's go back to that place. Go back to that, that time. And I want you to ask Jesus to reveal Himself. And I sat there for 10 minutes and I, in my mind's eye, in my memory, I couldn't see Him. And I felt anxious in that place. And then I saw Him walk in the room, bringing the solution to my problem. And it was like my heart got healed in that moment because there was an accusation of where were you, Lord? And then He come and He says, here I am. See, there was a promise, lo, I am with you always, Matthew 28. But I wasn't believing it. And I was walking out 
the experience that I had without Him in it. And some of you, it's bringing up a memory, it's bringing up a, a situation in the past, it's bringing up a situation now, which you're carrying. And we need to say, Jesus, where are you in the midst of this? Where are you in the midst of this? Let's just, right, band, let's raise the music. We're just We're gonna keep singing that if that's okay. We'll just keep singing that way maker. And we're just gonna say, Jesus, would you begin to reveal yourself right now in the moments and the memories in the situations and the circumstances. You are way maker, miracle worker, Let's sing that out. promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We ask that you'd release promises this morning for you us, God. You are way maker, promises miracle from worker, your word. promise keeper, because you're the, the promise darkness, keeper, Jesus. My God, that is you keep you your are. promises for us. You are Let's keep maker, singing it. Let's keep declaring worker, it. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You're making a way for us this morning, Jesus. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. We're asking that you that light up our darkness. In those areas where we see darkness, you see light. You that is who you are. That is who you are. That Let's sing it again. You You're the way maker, Jesus. We exalt you this morning. That is who you are. We exalt you, Jesus. That is who you are. Light in the dark. 
miracles beyond what we can imagine. And we thank you. We thank you for who you are. You are so worthy, worthy to be praised. Oh
Father, we lift up our dear sister Anna, God. I pray that you would uh, hide her and you would reveal yourself, God. The flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of the Lord endures forever. We believe in the word of God and I pray that, Lord, that you would speak through Anna today. May your kingdom come and may your will be done in this pulpit as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Is that better there, Ben? We're good? Okay. All righty. Um, I, I was actually going to check and see, um, Golda, if you're available for the next 40 minutes because you kind of had my sermon there. You could have just kept going. Did that work for you? All right. So today we are going to be talking actually about being knit into the church community. And I'm going to get cracking right away because I know there's a lot going on today. Um, I've simply titled this sermon, Knit Together. I'm going to open up with two verses. The first is Ephesians 4, verse 16. It says, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And then in Colossians 2, verse 2, we read, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. So what is being said there? I want you to consider a single piece of wool. I actually have a few images for you. <clears throat> Do you see how easily it can be frayed when it's on its own? All right, that is what it is like for us to be a Christian on our own. If we were to just show up every Sunday, there's another image we have, and we might look more like this, right? It's cool, there's a lot of wool, but there's not a lot of strength there, is there? But when we get knit together, then beautiful things begin to happen. And that's when strength begins to form. And this is why Paul told us to be knit together. It's a powerful thing to be knit into the body of Christ. The Lord will work through our brothers and sisters in Christ to teach us and encourage us to develop our talents, but all of that is limited when we are not an active part of what is happening. We all have our reasons for holding back our talents, but in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14, it says, brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. And be patient with everyone. I feel like this verse speaks to the differences between us all when it comes to why we might hold back. But the bottom line is, it's impossible to walk out the advice we are given about community in the New Testament by merely sitting in a pew once a week. That's, that's just the bottom line. So if you come into church and you sit here for an hour and a half and leave, do you even feel like you've had the opportunity to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of the weak or be patient with anyone? I mean, hopefully you haven't needed to be patient with anyone after an hour and a half. That'd be a pretty annoying person. When we truly get involved in a church, we not only spend more time together, but because we're on a schedule, then we see each other on both the good and the bad days. So now it becomes harder to let our mood determine our effort, right? It becomes harder to be surfacy with each other. When we're working together on those good and bad days, we see each other's highs and we see each other's lows. And when we're side by side problem solving together, we begin to see the spiritual gifts and talents in one another and also the struggles in each other. So even if a church is set up to function through a large paid staff, they cannot accomplish the most important things without each member of the congregation getting involved. And I'm going to explain why. Because you see, it's not just about running a church or helping a community. It's about the changes that being involved produce in each of us. Without that individual participation, spiritual growth in each believer will never reach its full potential. Matter of fact, you end up with hundreds of what Paul calls spiritual babies in the pews. 
waiting for their bottle of milk week after week, year after year. Seriously, you can read about that in 1 Corinthians 3. There are a number of things that will produce good spiritual growth in our lives, but one of them is being knit into the body of Christ and actively involved. So we understand that each of us being involved is key, but when a church grows large, it can be that much harder to do this. It's very tempting at that point to become a spectator and not participate. I mean, if we're all honest with ourselves, it's very easy to slip into the the background of a large church. Well, in South Korea, there's a church called Yoido Full Gospel Gospel Church Assemblies of God. And at one point, a number of years back, they had approximately one million members in their congregation. Now, you may think, how can anyone be known personally in such a large congregation? That's a fair question. I mean, I have a hard time getting to know people on this side of the church just because I sit over there, right? We're dealing with hundreds, not hundreds of thousands. But the answer is simple. It's through personal involvement. At that particular church, they've accomplished this first and foremost through their cell groups. Each person is knit into a cell group, and each cell group continues to expand and split. The founder, the late pastor David Yonggi Cho, was led to set up this church for many reasons. One of the reasons they built their church on cell groups is because they are under constant threat from North Korea. And they knew that if the regime was able to gain access, then the first people they would go after would be the church leaders. They wanted to make sure that even if their full-time leadership was killed or put in prison camps, that the church would continue to function. And it's true. I mean, an enemy might be able to round up like all the full-time church leaders, but what are the chances they'd be able to find about 100,000 cell group leaders, right? So at that church, it is through these cell groups that each person is celebrated during life's highs and helped during life's lows. It is through these groups that each person can have a safe place to grow spiritually and can be heard and seen, practice their spiritual gifts and contribute to the work of Christ. Another church I heard about was when my mom returned from a trip to the States a few years ago, and I remember her telling me about a thriving church she visited there where it was expected that anyone who wanted to become a member must both help somewhere and receive somewhere within the church. And they attributed this stipulation to the vibrancy of their church. For example, a person might volunteer as a greeter to help out, uh, but join a Bible study to receive. Each person needed to find something that fit their lives on both ends of the equation. Now at Open Door, we have traditionally, as you know, shied away from unnecessary rules and mandates in keeping with our goal to create a place where people can be spirit-led and where grace abounds. Instead, we have taken Christ's example of shepherding the heart. But the concept of intentionally both giving and receiving is one that we can fully encourage. We see examples of this all through scriptures. Christianity was never meant to be a spectator sport. Amen? It was never meant to be that. It was never meant to be a room full of people who just watch what is happening on a stage each week. And you were never meant to just be another face. None of you were. The scriptures are full of examples of disciples learning intentionally from others and giving intentionally to others. Never do you read in scripture of people who became a disciple of Christ and then did not participate in kingdom work in one form or another. This is not because churches are needy. Let's just kill that lie right now. This is because we need this involvement in our life. We need this. It benefits us when we get involved. We need to know others and be known. We need a safe place to practice our gifts. We need to pull as a team to accomplish kingdom work. And because none of us has been given all the gifts of the Spirit, and none of us have passion for every area, none of us possess every talent, well, we each bring a unique perspective to a situation. So we need each other. And besides all of that, honestly, it's fun. You don't know how interesting your day can get till you sit down back there and have a conversation with a two or three-year-old. Those little ankle biters are downright entertaining. (laughs) The first area I became involved with at Open Door was the leadership team of the 920 Youth, and honestly, I cherish the memories I have from those days. 
We had belly laughs, we cried, we annoyed each other, and we laughed some more. (laughs) We thought outside the box, and we got a front row seat to what God was doing in the lives of our youth. It was so cool. Some of the young adults from that time are now leading our kids, and some are now up here speaking. Good fruit is deeply encouraging. I don't think... Um, I didn't think I would end up there, to be honest. At the the time, youth leadership was the only thing I was determined not to do. (laughs) But that's a story for another day. And once I was helping with the youth, I didn't end up doing what I thought I would there. Um, I thought that I would end up helping with worship, but they didn't need another musician at the time. What they needed was help in the kitchen. So I teamed up with Rodney, and we made some stellar late-night snacks uh, for a mob, and then they needed some speaking, and well... And then they needed a bus driver, so I drove bus until 2020. And uh, it was during my youth leadership days that I really got to know Dennis and Jason and Rodney and Sean and Dan and Shona and Matt and Johnny and honestly and Kevin and so many others. We talked and we prayed until we were functioning in unison and then we moved forward together. We got to see what each leader reacts like under pressure. We got to see where each one shines and how their gifts uniquely contribute to situations. There's just no way I would have got to know those people the same way otherwise. There'll be hard days. Sometimes relationships can feel messy. But you know what else we all need? We all need to be sharpened by others. Proverbs 27 verse 17, right? It says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. These days, I'm not very involved with the youth, except for their camp each year. These days, Aaron and I have the privilege of serving with the altar team, which we love. Um, I also joined one of the church's Bible studies again, because I need to be poured into too. I need those women in my life. Over the years, I've met people who claim to be mature Christians, but never serve in any ministry in a church. And to be honest, I question that because it is often those same people who I am constantly finding need balance. I've come to the conclusion that it's easier for a person who is not committed regularly to be led astray. Perhaps it's because no one is there to catch it when they begin to say and believe things that aren't even scriptural, maybe. Whereas when we're working alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ, many of these things will naturally get nipped in the bud through conversation. Think about it. When you're washing dishes next to someone for half an hour, conversation begins to wander, doesn't it? When you're rolling out and loading 16 tables after a potluck, you're talking, right? When you're volunteering in Sunday school and one child seems to need something different than the rest of the group, it produces this healthy conversation together as you decide what a biblical response would be to that child's specific needs. And in those moments, iron is sharpening iron both through intentional problem solving and through the random conversations that happen in between. You may have downtime to fill while you're doing Sunday school check-in out there, and the next thing you know, you're discussing what took place at your home before you left that morning, and the person you are serving with might give you a new perspective on your day, right? You might start discussing current events, and they might have a scripture that applies to your latest conspiracy theory. This might take place while you're working alongside someone in, a new vis- in the new visitation team. It might take place serving coffee. It might even take place because you organized a few people to go take care of someone's yard, but it won't take place when you are on your own at home watching Netflix every night. That much, I guarantee. All right? During this process of serving together, we learn about the human side of those we are working with. We support them and we offer a healthy grace to their weaknesses but we also start to see them through God's eyes so we can call out that gold in them. We get this unique opportunity to come alongside their journey. We need each other. Friends, sharpen friends. Should there ever be a time that we don't get involved? Yeah, it's possible. I don't wanna, what I'm sharing up here today become some sort of law or burden on anyone's shoulders. It is possible to go through a season of readjusting, but that should be the exception in our lives, not the norm, okay? About 20 years ago, Aaron and I were going through a really tough season in life, and I remember it felt like every time I tried to get involved or help out in some way at church, it was unusually frustrating, and not because of anything that church was doing wrong. The only thing there seemed to be a real grace over for me at that time was to attend one of their cell groups once a week. 
it took me a while to accept that God had us in a season of lying low. The Lord eventually showed me that during that time of my life, I was fragile. I was in a weakened state. <clears throat> now, physically speaking, if a person is just hanging on by a thread, <laughs> just spent the last few days in the, in the trauma department of the hospital, so I know this, when you're just hanging on by a thread, they're put in the ICU, in the intensive care unit, right? Until they're stronger. It was like I wasn't in that place physically, but my heart was. And God showed me that he knew what state I was in and he was trying to put me in a safe bed in the ICU, so to speak, to take care of me for a while. But I kept trying to jump out of bed and help everybody around me. <laughs> well, if a person really was in ICU, that would be ridiculous behavior, wouldn't it? He was trying to give me a season of rest until I got my strength back. So just church and cell group it was. Now, the season I'm speaking about went on for a matter of months, maybe a year or two, but um, it wasn't the norm for our lives. If a person has been living a lot of their life in this state when it comes to church involvement, then that is a problem. It is time to move forward with whatever gifts God has given you. The truth is, if we always think of ourselves in a weakened state when it comes to the church, then we're likely treating the rest of our lives that way too. And God is looking to help us out of that ditch. He is looking to bring us into victory again. Sometimes we can create a ditch for ourselves, right? Maybe it's a ditch because of selfishness. I mean, our time is worth something, isn't it? Or it could be a, a ditch of victim mentality, always believing like we're the ones needing help more than others. Or like 1 Thessalonians 5.14 said, they might be timid and need encouragement. There are many ways we can ditch ourselves and hold back our talents, but often they're not healthy ones. It's like what we read. For some, we need to warn them because they're lazy. For others, we need to encourage them to step out because they're timid. And for the ones who are in a weakened state, for whatever reason, we need to take care of them. We're all coming at this topic from a different position in our lives. Generally speaking, we do tend to live in a very self-focused and entitled society. <laughs> Not big news to anybody. <laughs> and we tend to lose sight of how much we all need this kind of involvement in our lives, which is why encouraging us to get it knit in is the main point today. But I understand that another stream can exist. Every road has two ditches, right? There will always be a few who are wired to do good deeds constantly without bringing balance for the sake of their health and their family. So what am I saying? I'm saying that I am convinced that being knit into the body of Christ is essential to our spiritual growth. But I am not advocating for no balance in our lives, okay? I've said it before, there is no reward for general busyness when we get to heaven. Actually, there are books written about each of us, the Bible says, and those books contain everything that we are supposed to be doing with our days here on earth. And that's what we're gonna answer for when we go up there is whether we've done those things in our lives. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. We, I wish I could share more about that. There's just not enough time today. But those are the things we are designed to do and put here to do. As we learn to hear God's voice clearly in our lives, we will become aware of the times he is asking us to do something. And at that point, it's time to drop the excuses and take a step. All right, so we now know getting involved should be normal and we understand why. But another question that I'm often asked in this area is where a person should get involved. I found that when I'm volunteering in a way that matches my own passions and talents, then it doesn't feel draining. It feels life-giving. The physical side of me may still need rest afterwards, but I feel energized because my heart is filled. Lori, do you understand this? I know what you're doing with Yakira. It doesn't feel, it's like you're wired to do it. Like you can't stop thinking about it, right? And so you have to, it's like you're walking it out and you know you were created for this. You start to get to that point with some things and it feels like you're more alive than you've ever been. To dig further into this question of where to get involved, let's turn to Romans 12. We're gonna be camping on this scripture for a while. So those of you with paper Bibles, just open it up to Romans 12 and hold that spot. This is Romans 12 beginning in verse four. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. 
We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. Those of you who were here when Alan Thorner shared a few months back, do you remember when he was talking about this? Okay, so imagine if a foot was determined to do all your smelling for you, or if your ears wanted to do all the walking. It's ridiculous, right? But in reality, we all have a crucial part to play in the body of Christ, and we can't change how we were each created to function. So the sooner we function in our God-given role, the richer life gets for us and everyone around us. However, if we overthink this, we're never gonna get involved. So here's what I'd recommend. If your heart is one of a servant, just ask where the greatest need is and start there. This is a good starting place. From there, you will quickly begin to figure out what comes naturally to you and what doesn't. All right, so moving on to verse six. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your heart is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. He's saying, whatever your gift is, do it. <laughs> and do it well. Some say, but I don't know what my gift is. All right. Ask yourself what your passions are. What do you love and what upsets you? Do you know sometimes it's easier to figure out our passions from what upsets us, what annoys us? What issues are on your mind more? People going hungry or out of balance microphones, right? If it's the microphones, maybe it's time to learn tech. If you constantly find your heart is thinking about the disadvantaged in today's economy, then maybe it's time to join the church's team that we send over to Arcade or to go help in hot dog ministry, right? Give your heart that outlet it craves. Here's another thought that is super helpful. Ask yourself what things you find easy that others do not. What comes naturally to you? What activity makes you lose track of time? Some people find kitchen work a joy. To others, it's stress-inducing. Some people love to have conversation with new people. Others would rather serve a jail term. Um, I find writing easy, and I enjoy it, but you would not want me doing the church's finances. Word to the wise. If you feel called to something, the fruit of it will be evident to others too. If you think you are called to lead worship, but everyone else finds you painful to listen to, it might be time to go back to God with a soft heart. <laughs> Keep dancing. You go, girl. <laughs> At that point, we do go back to God with a soft heart and we ask him where to begin because otherwise it would be like we are that ear that is determined to somehow be afoot. We can try to cram ourselves into a position we weren't meant for, but it tends to end badly. Often it is through our journey of church involvement that God teaches us more about how he has wired us, and that is super exciting. However, there is one more thing that I should probably mention as a bit of a warning. There are many ways to serve in a church, but we need to be careful not to get focused on the positions we see filled on a stage each week. I know those are the ones that are most obvious to us, but some people get an unhealthy focus on that. I've heard people talk as though, like as though they covet a microphone. They seem to be ultra focused on a platform when they consider serving in a church, but I wonder how many of those people have considered what they are asking for. Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to make space in your lifestyle for the kind of commitment that it takes? Where's Rebecca? How, what time were you up today? Six. Six. And I bet that was hoofing it. Yeah. Because service, uh, their practice would start, what, 7, 7.30? You got to get, and you better hope you weren't partying till two in the morning. So what does it feel like to cut your Saturday night short? <laughs> and hopefully none of the kids were up during the night. <laughs> and they were. Okay. But it's not just that. It is also the fact that it is so important that we examine our motives before desiring something like this, okay? That's super, super important. Sometimes when I hear people talk about wanting the microphone, I think of when Jesus had finally revealed who he was to his disciples. 
it should have been this beautiful moment as he confirmed that he is the Messiah they've been waiting for. And instead, two of them, two brothers speak up and say, hey, about that, can one of us sit on your right hand and like one of us sit on your left hand in paradise? Oh my goodness. So it's like all they had on their mind was a place of importance for themselves. I mean, Jesus was probably tempted to shake those guys in that moment, but he didn't. He simply asked them whether they were willing to drink from the cup he was about to drink from. Sadly, those men did go through many of the same things that Jesus did, and both of them died the death of a martyr. They had learned how to pour out their life for others, right up to and including their own death. And this is why when I hear someone covet the microphone, I sometimes think, do you know what you're asking for? When it comes to any form of leadership in the church, we need to first understand a few basics. Now, this church has a leadership training course, and it's often said that God is looking for fat people. Fat is an acronym for faithful, available, and teachable. So faithful could look like a commitment to having, no, to having our roots in one spot. If we're constantly switching from one London church to another, why would someone depend on us to fill a long-term role? We need to first ask ourselves whether we are willing to make a long-term commitment so the people around us can get to know whether we are trustworthy handling the hearts of others and whether we will still be around when they need us. And furthermore, does that person show up regularly or just when they're in the mood? Available is an interesting one. Do we have space in our life for kingdom work? I mean, if we're always too busy to pitch in, then something like church leadership might not be the right time for this season of your life, right? We might have to find a more fluid place during this season of life, and that's okay. Maybe it's time to find teams that can handle last minute notice or areas that we can pitch in more randomly. And teachable, that's a big one. There are plenty of people, sadly, in our church who are super talented, dare I say even gifted, far more than myself or many others, but they've got these unique talents and spiritual gifts, but when they show up to everywhere wanting to be enlightened, wanting to enlighten everyone around them, right, rather than being able to receive teaching and correction. Being able to receive correction is needed because we're all still learning. (laughs) And if we consider this our home church, we should be expecting to be taught through situations in this place. So funny enough, I think it's easy for all of us to assume we are teachable. But ask yourself, when was the last time I heard correction that I didn't want to hear? How did I respond? Did I defend myself? Did I tuck tail and run? Did I give an obligatory Christian apology and then go bicker about that person to somebody else? Did I lick my wounds for the next few months? Am I still sharing about how that pastor shouldn't have tried to correct me 18 years ago? (laughs) These are hard questions to ask ourselves, but as they say, if the shoe fits, then it's time to bring this area to God with a soft heart. He'll help us. And the only reason I'm pausing on this one is because an unteachable heart will never reach its full potential for the Lord on earth. Okay, so that's important. So we aim to be fat in the best of ways, faithful, available, and teachable. It's not a bad thing to want to be a leader. It is beautiful, but it has to be for the right reasons. If you are a leader, you are a servant to the servants. You are also the easiest target and you answer to more from God. Don't get me wrong, it's amazing. It's amazing to have a front row seat to what God is working in the lives of others, but it needs to be birthed from a humble heart. We don't put an unhealthy focus on leadership for the sake of limelight or control, but we do keep growing spiritually through involvement and through that, many of us will likely end up in leadership to one extent or another, even if it is the small area that has become our expertise. All right, let's keep going on in Romans 12. You'll be amazed of what he says next, right after telling us to be aware of our talents and how to use them for the right part of the body of Christ, he immediately flows straight into how to get along, (laughs) which is almost funny to me. Let's pick up where we left off in verse nine. It says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. 
Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. Funny that he would go straight into talking about our character development right after talking about getting involved. It's almost as if he thinks the two are linked. Imagine that. (laughs) And they are. Being involved develops our character. Church is a great place to learn how to be a team member. This character development will be useful in every other part of our lives. At home, at work, in our community, with our extended family, it all comes into play. All right. Um, It is possible to be the most talented but not be the best team member. And this is part of what gets developed when we do this. Being a great team member means being ready to support a mission even if we don't always like what's going on. I'm not talking about getting on board with something immoral or something ridiculous like that. I'm talking about feeling the need to always be the boss. And this would be my advice to someone who struggles with boss syndrome. If you struggle with control, just remember that unless there is something wildly unscriptural going on, we just generally need to remember that it's not about us. Okay? Can we still get behind a leader even if they are moving towards a vision that God gave them or God gave the church leadership instead of the vision that God gave us, or that, I should rephrase that, instead of the way we think things should go, okay? Furthermore, if someone we are working with is on a learning curve, is our voice one that they would want in their life, or are we known for being critical? We may be smart, we may be 100% right, but we can still be 100% wrong because of how we are handling our amazing knowledge. Does that make sense? All right. The disciples had to be reminded of this. They had to be reminded that they were not leading but following. They had to be told they were in the flesh. Jesus even had to tell Peter once that he was speaking on Satan's behalf. Yikes. Peter wasn't trying to wreck anything. He just didn't understand the vision that his leader had been given. And finally, there's one more verse to wrap up our passage in Romans. Romans 12 verse 13 says... When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Now, there are many ways to reflect these words and build healthy community with one another, both inside and outside of these walls. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. How can we do that part? Well, first and most importantly, I think we can ask God to open our eyes and give us ideas because it's often the little things. Perhaps next time we're making a large meal, we put a portion in the freezer wrapped well. The next time we hear someone just had surgery, gave birth, or lost a loved one, we can give it to them. It could be that simple. And then there's the great part at the end. Always be eager to practice hospitality. You know, hospitality really is a practice. But it's a practice that is not to be underestimated. Oftentimes, good hospitality just boils down to paying attention to the needs of others. Really, if we were to demystify it, it's that simple. And that is where we see hospitality applied, even within these walls. Hospitality is essential to the body of Christ. And I'm going to explain how it works, because someone explained this to me many years ago, and it's changed me. A person with the gift of hospitality can create a safe space for others to relax. It's not just in their home that they have the ability to do this. They have this effect on people wherever they go. So... When a person can truly relax, they are able to let their walls down and then they are more open to what God is trying to say. Do you see it? So the best preacher, the best, the best um, teacher, the best prophet, the best you name it, is going to have better opportunities walking with a person who has practiced at hospitality because that person knows how to help soften the hearts of those around them. They've learned how to create a safe place and a welcoming place wherever they go. So we continue to practice this. All right, we finished that passage in Romans 12, and I have spent time correcting what position our heart should be in if we are desiring leadership. But here's where I need to bring the other side. We read earlier that some are timid, and I believe some of you should be leading right now, but you're holding back. You're timid. God is asking you to step out of the boat. Don't underestimate what he has already taught you over the years. Doesn't mean you have to have all the answers. That's not how it works. You learn as you go. Many years ago, Aaron and I were each given a dream. We had just moved an hour away. We were looking for a place to go to church. And we started to sense that God was asking us 
to play more of an active role in our next church, but we were hesitating in our hearts. It was around that time that we had these two dreams. In my dream, I was standing in the hallway of a church I was visiting after service. The women were talking, very similar to how anyone in the world would talk if they weren't following Christ. We'll just say in general that the conversation did not reflect a culture of honor. And in the dream, I didn't call them out on these things. I mean, I just met them. But I also wasn't participating in these antics. So the few things that I said or the times I was quiet somehow began to catch their attention. And before I knew it, all of them were turned, focused my direction and actively looking to be taught. And in that dream, um, I don't know, these people were brand new, like even, even in real life at that time, I, I didn't consider myself able to lead others my age and older, or somebody I had just met even wanting me to. I, even, um, I didn't even consider myself being able to be an example through conversation, but God was opening my eyes. He was trying to tell me that he had put me under some great people over the years and I had learned a lot and it was time to stop underestimating it. The impact I was making in this dream was so natural. It was literally just light conversation in a hallway. God was telling me to stop overthinking it. And meanwhile, about the same time, Aaron had a dream and in his dream, an F5 tornado had just ripped through this area. The, the area that he was in. The winds were so bad that they literally ripped the curbs out of the ground. The car we were sitting in had the front half of the car completely torn apart, but from the steering wheel back, it was untouched. So if you can imagine, we were inches from destruction, but untouched. Everyone on the side where we stood was shocked, but able-bodied. Before us, inches away stood this scene of total destruction in this dream. In that moment, it was not time to start looking for titles or for a doctor and then go check their credentials. It was time to just help out. We could have been sitting next to a five-year-old and he would have known with two able hands that it was time to pitch in. God was telling us both to stop overthinking it and stop treating ourselves like we had nothing to offer. He was asking us to step up to stop showing up on Sundays, waiting for our bottle of spiritual milk each week like babes in Christ because it was time to grow up. We don't need 37 speakers in this church, okay? It doesn't always look like being a speaker. I can tell you I never thought I would be doing this and for multiple reasons and that again is a story for another day. But the point is this type of volunteering is only a fraction of the leadership we need in this church. We might not need 37 speakers, but I bet we need about 37 cell group leaders. What are we calling them now? Where's Golda? Connections, connections connect groups, all right? So that's what we need, right? Same idea. Um, and honestly, that is a super rewarding thing to do. I'm gonna get the music team up here. Music team and the prayer team can get into place too, because I know you need a minute. I'm gonna be honest with you. This week was a, a really tough one. There was a, a lot flying at us, a lot of um, very important distractions, and it was hard on the heart. But you know what the highlight of my week was? We've been leading um, one of the Connect groups from our home for many months now, and we've been working with one couple for about five months now. And we went into that meeting exhausted and our hearts felt heavy. It had just been a very heavy, dark day. And it was just kind of one of those moments where you go, okay, God, when I'm weak, you're strong. And you take a step forward. And during that meeting, they saw something finally in the word that was pivotal and they got it. They got it. A revelation that is huge and they had never been able to catch what we were saying but they saw it for themselves in the word and the Holy Spirit opened their eyes to that thing and they both saw it and their eyes bugged out and they wanted to jump off the couch and they both had a hundred questions at once and they were so excited and I'm telling you it is so rewarding. A lot of people hold back from getting involved because it's not the right time, their life this, their life that, their life whatever, and 
Sometimes life throws these things at us. Sometimes it's just an attack to stop us from getting involved. And as I acknowledged earlier, there can be a season that we need to sit back. But oftentimes, it's a lot of fluff. It's a lot of distraction. And you know what? None of the things we were going through this week were eternal except for that. Amen? The car accident will be fine. The broken back will heal. Finances will come together. What's happening with the business? I don't know what God's going to do, but he's going to do it. And that other conversation, whatever. God will take care of these things. But what happened that night with that couple, nobody can ever take that away from them. And that's eternal fruit. When all the other fluff goes away one day, they have that. Because the Holy Spirit showed them something in the word. Amen? That is so rewarding. That is a ray of light in an otherwise really hard week that I have held on to. So I encourage you to watch for all the fluff and allow these opportunities of eternal fruit because it makes life worthwhile. It changes everything. As we serve together, we grow. Relationships grow, mentorship takes place, and bonds form that continue into our homes and communities. Christianity is a team sport. It always has been, it always will be. It is not a single lifeline between us and God. We were meant to be knit together. I'm gonna wrap this up with 1 Peter 4, verses 10 to 11. I'm gonna give God the last word. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. You are a good, good God. All these things, all this fluff that attacks us and distracts us is from the enemy, but you are the giver of all good things. And you are looking to bring us all into that place of victory. You are looking to grow us all more into the likeness of Christ and show us all more of what is eternal and what is not. You want us to have this opportunity to get on this exciting adventure. And so Lord, I ask that you would meet each person in their hearts today exactly where they are at. For those who are lazy, Lord, use your foot and give them a seat, the good one in the backside. Lord, you've had to do it to all of us before. That is up to you. <laughs> For those who are timid, Lord, I ask that you would encourage them. I ask that you would touch their hearts and give them the courage to be brave and step out and just see what you do. They will taste and see that you are good and they will grow in that place with no regrets. And Lord, for those who are weak, Lord, that you would open our eyes to what we can do for them and how we can shoulder them through this journey, Lord. Lord, help us to be patient with all as we are each coming to this from a different place. But your spirit will speak to each heart now, Lord, and I trust that each one will know what their next step is in this journey. So we would be that well-fit, well-knit-together body of Christ, functioning as one unit for your sake. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. If anyone needs to get past something that is holding them back, we just, I ask you, Lord, to give them the courage to come up to the prayer team and get prayer, get past that thing. It is time to live in victory again. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I'm also gonna mention to all of you that if you have questions about this, go see the information desk. Murray and Supriya are back there today. They're an amazing couple. If you don't know them yet, you're missing out. Find out what it is you're interested in. Ask questions. Find out what is involved with the group that's always been on your heart. And if you have any desire in you to lead a home group, but maybe you're not sure if you're the right person, go ask questions. 
questions are okay. They don't cost you anything, okay? This is not because Open Door is somehow needy. We're doing great. But you're all missing out if you're not a part of it. Amen? Amen. We love you to bits. All right, let's worship him. Please join in singing in the last song with us. Sing your praise 
Amen. And I thank you for the word. And I thank the Lord for this word. And uh, I just wanted to read this one scripture. The Lord just impressed in my heart to just speak this word of life. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. The Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. It's a blessing to receive, don't get me wrong. But the Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So I encourage you to not only receive blessing, but be a blessing. And everyone is part of the body of Christ. And we all have a function. And as Anna just mentioned, we all have a part to play. And God will use you according to His will. And the only thing that we need to do is, is to submit to His will. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. We thank you that this is your body and you are the head of this church. And we know that the gates of hell will not prevail against your body. And we thank you that, Lord, that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray for everyone in this congregation that we will not just come here to just receive, but we will also bless others by giving what you have given us, God. May you be glorified in this church congregation. And I, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of this congregation. May you be lifted up and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.